We're looking at the Matthew Christmas narrative today because obviously it is Christmas time, but there's another reason as well. As we have been going through our series named by God, here we have an opportunity at Christmas to think about why Jesus was named what he was named, and that's what we're going to focus on in our Matthew passage today. The reason we're doing this is because once we are clear on what Jesus' identity is and what his activities are, we will be clearer what our identity and our activities should be as well. So we are going to look at Matthew 1 today trying to understand who he is and what he's doing to understand the implications for us, for our identities, and for our activities. So if you want to follow along, uh, look at Matthew 1, starting in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you for what happened at Christmas and how important it is for us. We pray today that you would help our hearts to connect with the goodness and the importance of what you are doing in and through Jesus in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. People are made in the image of God. This is an important big idea in Christian and intellectual history. It affects so many things. Volumes have been written about this. It gives us a reason to assert the value and dignity of each person. And it affects ethics, policies. It affects how we think about what people are, what our purposes are, and how we should interact with one another. Now, as you approach the Bible, the fact that we are made in the image of God is a centrally important fact because it locates us in the middle of the story. Of course, God is the hero of the story, and yet the story is about God the Creator creating us and our interaction with Him and our loss of connection with God. God has made us to delight in Him and enjoy Him. He's made us in His image, and yet we have lost what that means. So there are various angles you can talk about when you talk about being made in the image of God. One angle is that we represent God. We uh, have a role to play representing him uh, to the world and to others. You can also argue that we are like God, meaning we share some of his attributes or characteristics. You also can make a good argument that being made in the image of God means that we are relational. We're made for relationships with one another but also that we're made fundamentally for a relationship with God. However, when you look closely at what the Bible says about being made in the image of God, what it emphasizes, the Bible emphasizes that because of our rebellion and independence, because of our sin, we've actually lost in some substantial way, we've lost the image of God, meaning we've lost the personal connection with Him, the intimacy that we're made for, the personal knowledge of God that He wants us to experience, that's the very thing that we have lost. And we feel it all the time. I mean, certainly this year we have all felt the reality of brokenness, and I'm guessing even this week you felt it as well. The climbing death toll reminds us of the fact that we all would rather ignore that life is much more brittle than we want it to be. It's fragile and it breaks easily. Our national discussion has been colored by raging uncertainty, deep political unrest, spiritual and emotional exhaustion with the pandemic, and the ongoing legacy of racism 
and its pain. Also, personally, we say, even as Christians, we're made for beauty, truth, and goodness, but most of the time we're happy to settle for comfort, entertainment, and numbness. You know, the people around us that we're supposed to love, we have a very difficult time loving. We don't trust them very well. And so we have all this relational pain and discord, either because of something that's happening that's unpleasant in your life and in your networks of family and friends, or because of something that isn't happening, something you desperately wish would happen that isn't. And then, of course, the holidays aren't always the happiest time of the year for us because they remind us of what relationships are lost and broken, people that we used to celebrate with that we don't anymore, or even simply the lack of connection, people that we would and should have the deepest connections with and we are reminded that we don't. All of this together is depressing, potentially. It's sad, it's broken, and it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of progress to be made on any of those fronts. And those reasons are exactly why Jesus has come at Christmas. He's come to change things. He's come to reestablish the image of God and to renew our purposes. He's come to deal with what has gone deeply and fundamentally awry. So Jesus has come at Christmas to be our Savior and to be Emmanuel. That's what the text tells us. That is what Jesus is named in this passage. And those are the two key ideas, our two sermon points, that Jesus is our Savior, so he's for us, and Jesus is Emmanuel, so he is with us. Let's look first at this idea that Jesus is our Savior. Now, that's what the name Jesus means. He saves. He comes to save us. God is saving us in and through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus saves us by identifying with us so we can identify with him. He does it by becoming fully one of us, fully like us. He's fully human. And he does that so we can fully become like Jesus. We can become what we were always meant to be in an intimate relationship with God. Jesus has come down, we often say. He's come down into our weakness, our sin, and our shame, and he's come to take those things on himself in order to take them off of us. And he takes them on himself so that he can take us up. He can reconnect us with God and with true purpose. Our problem, of course, is that we're sinful, and our sin slays us spiritually, which means it separates us. It separates us from God. It separates us from true and final goodness, and it separates us from our own sense of proper identity and purpose. And we can't undo that. We can't fix it. We can't work around it. But this is why Christmas had to happen. Jesus has come to undo all the sad things, to begin to work backwards the effects of sin and to reconnect us with what we were always made for. He's come into our, the fullness of our brokenness and sin to deliver us into the fullness of his salvation, the fullness of eternal joy so that we might experience shalom, harmony, and wholeness with God. So it's right to say that Jesus as Savior saves us from our sin, but also for purpose, for intimacy. We're meant to love God and love others, and that's what he's made us for. And we do not do that well on our own. We actually can't do it properly. And so he's come to change our reality and reconnect us with him. Now, I want you to consider, what does it mean? What's the relationship between Savior and Emmanuel, between God being for us and God being with us. Well, God has come. He sent Jesus to be for us, to live and die for us, to change our situation. But he did that so he could be with us. And Jesus is with us. He loves us. He's close to us. He's near so that we can truly know and believe that he's always for us. These two things always go together. And so his work for us allows him to be with us, which leads us to our second point that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Prepositions matter. Uh, Not always, but often they do. For example, if you made a request of me, I would want to know whether you said, I want you to get in the car 
on the car or under the car. The preposition there really matters. It could be very, very important, especially once that car starts moving, whether I'm in it, on it, or under it. Prepositions matter here as well. We often talk about life with Jesus as if it is about him or from him or for him. Those are all true. But fundamentally, I think the most important preposition, the word that rightly changes all of this from being promotional to relational is the word with. We don't simply live life for Jesus to promote him. We're living life with him. You know, we are not employees. We're not mercenaries. We're not loyalists. We're not simply doing his bidding. We're his people. We belong to him and he belongs to us. He lives with us and we live with him. And so because of his love for us, we are able to respond to what he has for us. We're able to live life with him him. This is God's design for us. It's absolutely true that life is for him, that life is from him, that life is about him. Those things are all true and even important. They're biblical realities. And yet, for those prepositions to be true, you need these other prepositions first. You need life to be with and in Jesus Christ. Life is found in Jesus, in your connection with him, your union with Christ, your relationship with him, and life is found with him. That's how life is found, and that is how the Christian life is meant to be lived, relationally, personally, with Jesus. This is what Christmas is about, that he has come not simply to do something, but to be among us, to bring us back into an experience of a relationship with him, back into the personalness of relationship that's been lost. You know, we all feel this, and as Paul Hewson sings, every shipwrecked soul knows what it is to live without intimacy. Right? You know this interpersonally, what it means to be shipwrecked and to be unable to relate to other people, but that reality reflects the deeper fact that we are lost without God. We have no intimacy with Him. We're disconnected from Him, and thus we're disconnected from our true purposes, from our actual identities. As a result, we often feel that we're alone, that we're alone. We don't know really if there's a God or not. We just have to sort of do the best we can to cobble together a life with what we see around us and Thus, it becomes an accumulation of experiences or stuff or relationships. And when we realize that that doesn't work, sometimes we end up just assuming that we're killing time. But Jesus has come at Christmas to change all that. He's come to repurpose us, to help us reimagine what we're for. We are actually made for God to be with him, to experience and enjoy him. He comes personally because the best and hardest and most important things in life need a personal touch. I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal last week. It said that leaders, I think it was particularly meaning political leaders, but I think you could apply it all different places, that the personality of a leader is oftentimes even more important than their policies because there's something about the personalness of it that matters to us. I went to a dental hygienist one time. I think she was plenty competent, but she was unpleasant. She was impatient. She seemed to be in a hurry. And in her hurriedness, she was personally not very enjoyable. And I never went back to that dental hygienist because personalness matters. You know, when you have a nightmare, even as an adult, uh, oftentimes it's very disorienting. You're not even sure if it's true or not. And it can legitimately uh, lock you up and you can be living in terror in that moment. And oftentimes what you need is someone outside of your dream to come in and shake you awake gently, to tell you, oh, it's just a bad dream, you're going to be okay, and to settle your spirit. You know, probably like me, many of you as parents have contorted your body into all sorts of shapes over the years to get on or next to or maybe half under your kid's bed to calm their spirits because the only thing that would help them sleep again after that nightmare was your personal presence. See, when it comes to the most important things, the best things and the hardest things, sometimes it, all that we can need, the only thing that will make a difference 
is personal presence. And Jesus has come personally to be with us. He's changed our reality so that we can reconnect with this sense of personal presence that he wants to be with us so that we can be with him. And Christmas is to convince you, to compel you, to woo your heart, to see, in fact, that God is coming after you, that he's come for you so that he can be with you. The life and identity of the Christian, then, is defined by Jesus. A Christian is someone who follows Jesus Christ. We have been saved by him so that we can be with him, and that's our new identity. People who've been saved by Jesus, people who live life with Jesus, and because we see clearly who he is and what his identity is, then we can begin to figure out who we are. Then with this renewed identity, a person who has been saved by Jesus, a person who lives life with Jesus, with that renewed identity, we can pursue renewed activity. Our identity and our activity as a Christian is always defined in relation to him, who he is, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. Do you know that Jesus has come for you? Do you personally believe that Jesus was born for you, that he lived for you, that he died for you, and that he rose for you. And he did all of that for you so that he could be with you and that you can be with him. If you don't believe that, if you haven't believed that, then Christmas is a call to come and behold him and to respond. He offers you the chance to Know that he is for you and that he is with you. Because once you know those things personally, not as a theory, but that you personally trust and believe that he is for you and he is with you, you can begin to reconnect with what he has for you to do. And that's the purpose of Christmas. That's the purpose of him being Savior and Emmanuel. He wants to reconnect you with God and reconnect you with what you were made for, to know him, to worship him, to enjoy him, and to live life with him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that Jesus has come at Christmas. He's come down into our mess, into our rebellion, and he's come down to turn things, to turn our hearts, to turn us back to you. He's come to be for us, and he's come to be with us. He's done this in time, in history, when we weren't even alive, and yet he did it for us personally. He took our sin on himself so that he could move it off of us, out of our lives. It would no longer condemn us, but we would be free. Father, we thank you that this good news has come at Christmas, and it's available to us every day by faith. Every day we can be reminded and we can know that we belong to you, that you have worked for us so that you can be with us and so that we can be with you. Father, this year at Christmas, help us to reconnect with your purposes for us. Help us to enjoy you, to love you, and to love the people around us because of the great love that you have shown in Jesus. Father, we thank you for all these things, and we ask them in the great name of Jesus. Amen.